So today we're going to talk about pattern formation and um, I guess pattern formation is important to me but it's important to I would argue every single scientist because what we fundamentally do, what fundamentally any scientist does is looks for patterns either in data, in time, in space, in mathematical formulae and it's a question of pulling out those, those patterns from the data. One of the reasons we plot graphs for example is to, um, to extract those patterns to make them much easier to see. One type of pattern I've worked with over the past few years and a pattern that crops up time and time again in nature is something called the cellular network or a foam or a froth. There's different names for this type of structure. But I guess the, the, one of the, the best examples of a, of a foam or a froth is if you take some soap, take some water, put some soap in it, shake it up, you'll get a foam. Everybody's familiar with that. Cappuccino froth or if you're having a beer with the head in a head in a beer, you get this type of froth, this foam-like pattern. And what way do we characterize that? When we look at that and we, what we can do is we, is we characterize this, we'll, we sketch it out um, in terms of, of polygons. So we count up the, count up the number of, of bubbles, uh, which are have three, four, five, six, seven, eight sides. And from looking at that distribution of those sizes, we can get we can get a lot of information. But that's really that's that's sort of the mathematical side of things, and it's it's a way of giving us lots of information. But what I, I really want to focus on is just how ubiquitous, just how many times this particular type of pattern crops up in nature. So this is a cross section through a cork from a wine bottle. So this is the structure of the, of the wood, basically. Yeah. So this bar is 100 microns across micrometers. A micrometer is one millionth of a meter. So here we're talking about um, a 10,000th of a meter. But you can see that you've got this polygonal structure. So everything isn't, it's not like a, a, a honeycomb. It's not like a bee's honeycomb where everything's a hexagon. Here we've got this distribution of, of, of different sided cells. So we've got four sided, five sided, six sided, seven sided. So here's one six sided. Here's a hexagon basically, here's a pentagon. Um, we've got anything that's sort of four-sided, difficult to see, mainly five, six-sided, maybe some seven-sided like here. Let me count it up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. That's one particular type of structure. Now you've seen this structure before, but in a completely different context, which is there. So here again we get another structure, which is polygonal. We've got these various different cells, which have a number of different sides and they link together. So that is actually a photograph of the side of a giraffe. So that's, we've gone a, a factor of four time, four orders of magnitude, four powers of ten basically, from that structure to that structure. If we go to something which is uh, sort of very close to my heart, this is called the Giant's Causeway in Antrim in Northern Ireland, very close to where I was brought up. This is a structure formed basically uh, due to the um, cracks forming in lava flow quite some time ago and if you look at that structure, if you look down on it from above and again plot out the, the polygons, again you see the same type of, of dis distribution of, of polygons with different sizes. So time and time again on different length scales we've seen this structure cro cro cropping up. Similarly mud, if you take some mud and you dry that mud you get cracks in that just to relieve the strain and again you see this same type of cellular pattern cropping up again. So salt plains in Argentina, again you see this type of cellular network structure stretching off in this case into the distance and that again arises from one of these type of cracking patterns. But what's interesting and what first sort of got me interested in these type of cellular network patterns is um, on the left hand side what we see Notice the scale bar here, so that distance is 150 nanometers, so a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. And you see this type of cellular structure again, and what these are, these, these branches are made up of nanoparticles. So what we do is we take a drop of nanoparticle solution, these are gold nanoparticles, we put it onto a surface and we let the solvent dry. And you look at the arrangement of nanoparticles that are left. And what you see is something like this. Indeed, if you look at a coffee stain on a small enough lens scale, you'll see the same type of cellular pattern again. But what I find intriguing is if you look just even by eye qualitatively, if you look by um, compare these two, you see quite striking similarities in terms of the overall structure of the, um, the system. And just to give you an idea of lens scale, this is a colleague from, who's Argentinian from computer science, Natalio, who um, took the photo, sent it to me, he thought I'd be interested in it. But you, to give you an uh, idea of lens scale, so um, uh, Natalio's what, 5 foot 8 I guess, this is 150 nanometers, so the, the disparity in lens scale is huge. And that's, 
that's when scientists get really, really fascinated and really excited, is that when you see the same type of pattern cropping up across a huge range of different lens scales, but it gets even sort of better than this because right at the, the, the highest lens scales, the largest lens scales, the, the distribution of galaxies in the universe is best described in terms of, of, of a foam like a cellular network. And in fact, it's called the cosmic foam. And if you go right down to the other lens scale in terms of when you get right down to the very smallest limits in terms of the Planck length, which is 10 to the minus 35 of a meter, unimaginably small number, Again, some people, well, this is open to interpretation and there are very many criticisms of this, but some people have suggested that when you get down to that land scale, it's best describe the quantum world in terms of a foam as well. So you get over from the very, very smallest things to the very, very largest things. You see these, these things, these foam-like structures crop up time and time again. The skeptics would say that, well, you know, your eye is very, very good, or the human eye is very, very good, and the human brain is very good at picking patterns out of nothingness. And if you look at the constellations, um, you know, we've, we've looked at those distributions of stars, purely random, and we've picked out various different characters, we've picked out animals, we've picked out different objects. So you're imposing the order. It's important, of course, that what we want to do is to make sure that the, our eye or brain is not being fooled. And so what we need to do is to resort to mathematics and to quantify these things. And one way we quantify those things, which um, I guess is best described using... This is um, some work from a student a long, long, long time ago, actually. And um, what we have is we see one of these cellular network structures, which we've drawn out, um, which comes from one of our nanoparticle um, samples, but it could come from a soap sample, it could from, come from the side of a giraffe, any of those things. And so what you do is you count up, you can either do it laboriously by hand, or as we now do, is you, you, we get a computer to do it. You count up the number of cells, uh, the, the number of cells with three, four, five, six, seven sides, etc., and you plot that out as a distribution. You also, for example, can look at the areas of these cells and you can look at the perimeter length. And so you get these quantitative measures of, of the similarity between different cellular structures. And I think one of the most interesting, wacky, off-the-wall examples of this type of process, which we call statistical crystallography, where you take a cellular network like this and, and, and look at its structure mathematically, is that a study from a group in NASA back in the mid-90s. Well, what they did was they took some spiders and they gave those spiders a range of different, well, narcotics, um, including marijuana, caffeine and benzodrine. Um, you can see from just looking, in this case, just looking at the actual spider webs that have been formed by the, the various different types of drugged up spider that you get very diff very great differences and what they did was they actually used this statistical crystallography approach to, to quantify those differences. Yeah so it well, interestingly it looks like marijuana and caffeine in terms of scrambling the spider's ability to make webs look to be much the same which is I guess a slightly of concern for me given the amount of caffeine that I drink.